Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to share an amazing Roman monument with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episodes get started, all sources and images referenced will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find that link in the episode description, as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. Welcome back to Accessible Art History, the podcast. This week, I'm going to be discussing one of my personal favorite locations in Rome. The Colosseum dominates the landscape as a testament to one of the most famous phrases for the ancient empire, Panem e Circense. Its incredible preservation allows us to catch a glimpse into the chaotic revelry and balance of power that kept Rem going. So, to learn more, keep on listening. And special thank you to listener Mike for sponsoring today's episode. I think it's a good idea to start this episode off with a question. What exactly is the Colosseum? Its name has essentially become synonymous with the city, but not everyone knows what it means. The Colosseum is also known by another name in honor of its builders, the Flavian Amphitheater. An amphitheater is akin to our modern-day sports stadiums because it's an opener venue meant for entertainment purposes. They were incredibly popular buildings in ancient times, and we see examples of them all over the Roman Empire. However, the Roman Colosseum is by far the largest freestanding amphitheater and still is to this day. How cool is that? I hinted at this a moment ago, so let's talk more about the builders of the Colosseum. Before I get to the actual story though, we need to rewind the clock a bit. If you'll recall last week's episode on Emperor Nero, you'll remember that he built himself an entire complex called the Domus Aria after the Great Fire of Rome. When he committed suicide in 69 CE, his family line, the Julio Claudians, came to an end. This left quite the power vacuum in Rome, and that year became known as the Year of Four Emperors. The final man to claim the title was named Vespasian, and he was from an equestrian family called the Flavians. Much of his power came from his military prowess, including campaigns in Britain and Judea. The latter campaign was the result of a major Jewish rebellion that became known as the First Jewish-Roman War. Vespasian was sent by Nero to help quash it. The Roman forces were far stronger than the Jewish ones, mostly because it was an established military versus a rebellion force. Vespasian and his troops destroyed towns and re-established Roman rule in the power vacuum left behind. Between 70 and 71 CE, the Roman army sieged and later captured the holy city of Jerusalem. The forces then proceeded to sack the city, including destroying the temple and taking all of its treasures. All of the gold and religious artifacts were taken back to Rome by Vespasian's son Titus. After it was paraded in triumph, Vespasian decided to use the funds to rebuild the area that Nero used for his personal Domus Aria. In a smart PR move, Vespasian chose to create a public space for the people of Rome to enjoy and not just limit it to the upper echelons of society. And what better way to accomplish this than an amphitheater? And one fun fact about the Colosseum's name, it actually came from the giant statue, or Colossus, that Nero had made in his image that was in the area. Surprisingly, Vespasian left it up near his new building and didn't melt it down for more money. The Colosseum is oval-shaped and measures at about 617 feet or 188 meters in length, 512 feet or 156 meters in width, and 187 feet or 57 meters in height. This makes it about twice as long and one and a half times as wide as the average American football stadium. Surprisingly for its size, it only took about a decade to build. The speed can be explained by the fact that Vespasian ordered about 100,000 slaves that were captured in the First jewish Roman War to build his gift to the Roman people. One of the things that makes the Colosseum unique is its location. By utilizing the land that Nero had already set aside in the center of the city, Vespasian did put the construction at a disadvantage. Typically, amphitheaters were built into a hill so that the earth could help to hold up the sheer weight of the stone. But in Rome, the Colosseum was built and away from any of the city's seven hills. The structure is built of massive travertine blocks, tufa, which is a volcanic rock, and concrete faced bricks. The blocks, which were quarried in nearby Tivoli, were held together with iron clamps. Originally, the Colosseum also had a canvas roof that could be rolled back and forth depending on the angle of the sun. How cool is that? It reminds me of T-Mobile Park, the home of my team, the Seattle Mariners. Although today the canvas has long since disappeared, the mechanisms for its movement still remain. The Colosseum could seat between 50,000 and 80,000 people. The Romans, in their usual fashion, were quite organized, building multiple entry and exit points so that passageways and pathways would not get blocked. As with today's modern stadiums, there was a hierarchical system of seating. The best seats, those closest to the action, were reserved for the highest and richest members of society. When the Colosseum was finally completed between 80 and 81 CE, there's some debate about the actual date, it was truly a time for celebration. After all, this was the biggest amphitheater in the empire. 
Titus, who had succeeded his father Vespasian the year before, ordered that there would be 100 days of games. This would have been incredibly expensive, but the imperial treasury was quite full after Titus' successful campaign in Judea. He spared no expense to show the Roman people a good time. Though not everyone had a good time, historians estimate that around 2,000 gladiators lost their lives during the celebration games. Next, I'm going to talk about the ways that the Colosseum was utilized, but first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, But they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part, it's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Hi there, my name is Annalisa and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support Accessible Art History monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's talk about the different kinds of events that took place at the Colosseum. Obviously, the most famous events were the gladiatorial combat ones. Gladiators were often slaves or captured people who were trained in schools to fight. These fights were to the death and were quite gruesome. There were many types of gladiators, each with different styles of armors and weapons. The four major styles were the Samnites, the Thracians, the Mermilos, and the Retariuses. Winning gladiators were seen as celebrities in ancient Rome. Archaeologists have found numerous sites of graffiti all around the empire, mostly about the gladiators' romantic prowess. Some examples include, quote, Oceanus, the barmaid's choice, and, quote, the delight of girls. In fact, we actually have records of affairs between women and gladiators. Another popular event were the animal hunts, or the venatio. Gladiators would fight a variety of exotic animals, including rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, elephants, giraffes, lions, panthers, leopards, bears, tigers, crocodiles, and ostriches. Most of these animals were shipped from around the empire for the entertainment of the Roman people. The sets would have been quite elaborate, made to look like natural landscapes and complete with moving parts. Archaeologists have found evidence of these fights from thousands of animal bone fragments. Another fascinating event that was held at the Colosseum were staged naval battles. During these spectacles, the space would have been flooded to create a large lake. For example, during the inaugural games, it is said that Titus had trained horses and bulls swim up next to the ships. What a sight it would have been, and it is important to note that there is some debate from scholars about how this would have been accomplished. One leading theory is that the water channel was later used as a tomb or hypogeum. Regardless, the original events of the Colosseum would have been quite amazing to see. A conversation about the Colosseum wouldn't be complete without a discussion about its rules in the early days of Christianity. Many Christians believe that the amphitheater was the site of martyrdom in the first couple of centuries CE. Of course, we do know that many early Christians were martyred in Rome, including Saints Peter and Paul. However, there is little evidence that martyrs were actually killed at the Colosseum. It's possible a few were killed as part of a spectacle as they would have been arrested for refusing to worship the Roman gods or for unlawful assembly in their home churches. However, most of these people were executed at another podcast location, the Circus Maximus, due to its religious significance. Pope Pius V, who led the church in the 16th century, declared the entire Colosseum was a relic due to the fact that it was, quote, soaked in the blood of martyrs, end quote. In the 19th century, stations of the cross were erected in the martyr's honor, increasing its status as a holy site. Today, many Christians still honor the Colosseum as a site of martyrdom. 
Each year on Good Friday or the Friday before Easter, the Pope leads a procession to remember their sacrifice. Today, as you may know, the Colosseum is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Rome. Around 4 million people visit each year. Archaeologists are constantly making new discoveries and working with organizations such as UNESCO, charities, and the Italian government to ensure that it's preserved for future generations to enjoy. In fact, Diego della Valle, head of the shoe firm Todd's, pledged 25 million euros of his personal fortune to help restore the Colosseum. It was a bit controversial at the time because it was a public-private partnership and work took several years, but it helped fix and clean the magnificent structure, some of it for the first time in its life. Amazingly, Italy wants to revive the entertainment elements of the Colosseum. In 2020, the government sought funding to help build a retractable floor. This would cover the excavated tunnels and underground areas, allowing people to stand in the center and enjoy concerts, performances, etc. 2,000 years later, and people haven't changed much. Bread and circuses, am I right? The Colosseum is a standing testament to the power of persuasion. After a difficult trek to the throne, Vespasian and his family knew they had to do something to set them apart. And building the world's largest amphitheater certainly accomplished that. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the Arch of Titus. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out on the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, you can find episodes on there about two weeks after the episodes are posted. Cheers and see you next week.